Hi everyone, my name is Christina. I work at the UCLA Career Center. Welcome to the Pre-Health Application Week, day two. Our presentation today is You Got Mail, How to Ask Professors for Letters of Recommendation. You can see the agenda on the screen. And I will stop share now and I will invite our guest speaker, Jay Fellon, to start his presentation. Thank All you right. so much for doing this for us. <laughs> Well, you're welcome and thank you, Christina, so much for having me. I hope everyone is able then to see my screen. I'll make the slides full screen as necessary, but I hope that you are um, all doing well and I appreciate you coming at a 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. So let's start right in. Although the, the title was about getting effective letters of recommendation, I'm going to step back a little bit from there because I think before that's even possible, you have to have developed an effective relationship with various uh, people in your life, people at UCLA. The stuff that I'm going to be talking about tonight comes from a book that I've written with my friend Terry Burnham. He's on the left there, I'm on the right. In younger days, we've worked together for many, many years, but we have a book coming out this summer and it's called The Secret Syllabus. We wrote it to help students who are in college and they wanna get the best outcomes from their college experience, but they don't always know how to do it, what to do to get mentors, to get a recommendation letter and so on. So I will be drawing upon that. The Secret Syllabus is available on Amazon. Now you can pre-order it, but I don't think it comes out until July or something like that, but you may decide that you wanna buy it. Okay, the way I'll talk about this is that you first need to think about an overall relationship strategy. That sounds kind of weird and scary, but it's going to be a useful thing to have as you move through your career at UCLA. Then I'm gonna give you some very specific guidance on things that I think are helpful, things that are less helpful when you're trying to develop these professional relationships, and then some specifics about asking for and getting a good recommendation letter. Now, there's a game that I play with a class that I teach sometimes, and we're not gonna do it here today because I'm gonna go through a ton of material very quickly for you. You can go back, I'll make the slides available. But one of the things I do is I ask students to think about one of their least effective teachers. And sometimes this will happen. A teacher will need recommendations from students. And the teacher would say, I'm coming up for an important job review. Will you write a one paragraph positive review of me? And I have the students write this. This is about one of their least effective teachers. Then we do another exercise where I say, think about your best teacher that you've had in college and imagine that they've asked you this. I'm coming up for an important job review. Will you write a one paragraph positive review of me? Then what we do, and this is based on some published research that came up with, the, with similar findings to what I'll find, what do you think are the features that come up when people are trying to write a positive letter, but it's about their least favorite teacher that they had in, in college? Turns out that as you read through these, stuff comes out between the lines. You're like, yeah, the words are positive, but I'm not sure this is the person that we want to accept in this program or the person we want to give the award to or whatever. What are the features? The features tend to be not very specific. They're vague generalizations. Well, they did this or they did that, but not a lot of specifics. The second is that they tend to be more about just effort and never about outcomes. They tend to be confined to a short period of time and so on. On the other time, other hand, the strong recommendations have a lot of specificity. They did this thing, which is fantastic. They did this other thing. We've had interactions in all of these different contexts. They were richer in all those different ways. So the data actually look like this just from a re recent class where this is people writing about their least effective professor. When other people interpret those letters, 64 uh, say that, okay, that was a, that's a weak letter. 
15% get tricked into thinking it's strong. But when they're writing about their best professor, only 4% think it's not a great letter. 80 think that it is a good letter. What we can conclude from these is that people are really good at evaluating what's going on in this letter. Is this a person who we want to interview? Is this a person we want to hire? Is this a person we want to accept into the program? That has important consequences for you, not because you're going to be writing recommendation letters, but you have to think about being the subject of a letter. Have you caused there to be all of the necessary interactions that this person can write a letter that everyone reading the letter is going to say, ooh, this is good. This is a person that we want to know more about. You can't rush that. You can't three years into college say, okay, now I'm going to have a deep, rich relationship with some faculty mentor. It's one of the few things that you can't just pull an all-nighter at some point late in your college career and say, all right, now I need to have great relationships so I get great letters of recommendation. It doesn't work. If you don't start early on, you're not going to be as successful at it. So for instance, let me, you don't have to read this whole letter, but this was a letter I had to write about someone years ago. I liked her a lot, but I didn't think that she was going to thrive in graduate school. She wanted to, to pursue a program. So I was, so with pleasure, I provide a reference for Pearl during the year and a half I've known her. She's impressed me with her commitment to blah, 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 her thirst for knowledge, effusive personality. So she does want to learn and she is a nice person. Uh, as her professor, I was able to interact with her in an academic situation. In this class, uh, considered one of the most difficult in the curriculum, Pearl did well. <laughs> it's, it almost just oozes uh, mediocrity because I don't want to say something that's not true, but I liked her. So I say, here's what we did in the class. Here's how she did. These are things that are all on the transcripts though. So it's not really adding a whole lot and continue our discussions outside of class. She's engaged me in numerous conversations. I don't even say numerous great conversations, just we've talked a bunch. Now, contrast this with, what if I'm writing a letter about someone that I think is a truly remarkable student and that a school is gonna be lucky to get her for one of their graduate programs? I had the chance to do that for someone else, a friend named Alicia. And from this letter, you see, for starters, better letters tend to be a little bit longer, but there's also a lot of specificity. It's a real pleasure for me to recommend Alicia. You start to see superlatives. I cannot imagine anyone better qualified for your program in the more than 10 years. So we have a long relationship. That's good. Impress me with her unparalleled writing and teaching skills. So I have some experience with that. Her exceptional communication skill, her intelligence, her productive and constructive passion, blah, blah, blah. Then I get to say in several beautifully written papers, she synthesized and evaluated down here. I've never met someone as passionate in her love of language or as accomplished in the dexterity with which she uses it. Her vocabulary is prodigious, her skills of wordplay and language use spectacular. These are the things you want someone to say about her. Everywhere that Alicia applied, they accepted her. Every job she tried to get, they got. I'm not saying it's because of my letter, but I'm saying it's because she was the kind of person who had developed these relationships. So how do you do that? The first thing that you have to think about, as I said, is that it's a long game, that a relationship can't be rushed. If you're looking at a movie, yeah, they can do a montage. <laughs> and at the end of the montage, they have whatever they need. But in real life, you can't do that. What you should think about, what I think is, is helpful, is this. People in the world of sales have this saying where they, they say, for every 10 meetings that you have, you're going to get three decent prospects, potential sales. And from that, you're going to get one sale. It sounds a little bit crass thinking about finding recommendation letter writers as a sales job, but I find that it's helpful if you do think about that. From your perspective, what does it mean? It means, well, if you write 10 intro emails to various professors that you have, that's going to get maybe three that you have multiple contacts with. If you have three long-term multiple contact interactions with someone, that's going to lead probably to at least one long-term ally. Well, who are these people that you are going to 
think of as your intro emails, your 10 good meetings. The way you do this is look at your class schedule, right? Every year you're going to have, let's say you take three or four classes, that's three or four instructors times three quarters. You've got about 10 instructors per year. Ultimately, you're going to want probably three, maybe four good recommendation letters. So it's about one per year. So if you have 10 instructors per year and you're able to ultimately turn that into one person that is going to write a strong letter on your behalf, you're gonna be doing pretty well. So how do you do that? First thing you have to do is you have to find the people that you connect with, that there's, there, there's something about their approach that resonates with you. They have to be in an area that you think is going to be something that you're motivated to be interested in, although that's not critical. They can still speak to your abilities and skills, even if they are far afield from what you want to do. So you have to look at them every quarter. All right, who are my teachers? Or maybe it's a TA that you have, because by the time you're applying for something, they may already be a faculty member or something. You have to make an initial contact with them in a way that's honest, thoughtful, you don't want to trick them. You want to be your genuine self. You want that to, to come through. But if you're viewing this from the lens of a relationship strategy, it's a long play that you're thinking about. It's not a one-off that you tell the person, hey, I'm in your class. I, or I was in your class last quarter and I got an A. Too often people think that that's the secret to a good recommendation letter. Well, I got an A in your class. That's already on your transcript. The recommendation letter, if it's going to have value for you, needs to be selling features of you that don't come through in other ways on your application. That's the added value. If it's just a rehash of, they took this class, we covered these topics, here's how they performed, it's redundant. Think about that, that you need more than that. You're trying to have a relationship. So you want to make this initial contact. Then you want to have opportunities that you can deepen the relationship that go beyond just, okay, I'm in your class. I like your class. You have to get to something new. You're developing a relationship. It's going to be tricky. It's not easy. It's not just a recipe that you follow some steps and then you have it. There are a lot of intangibles that go on here. Finally, then you have to stay in contact in a way that doesn't make you too a burden to this professor because professors get a lot of emails. I get more than a hundred a day, every day, seven days a week. I can only write about 35 or 40 per day. That means that invariably 60, 70 people every day, I can't write back to. I feel bad about it, but it's just not physically possible. So something's going on that causes me to write back to one person but not right back to another. So we're gonna explore that, ways that you can nudge yourself into the pile of people who gets the response, which leads to the follow-up interaction, which leads to the mentoring, which leads to good things happening to you in your life. So this first take-home message that I would say is that you need a relationship strategy. You have to think very analytically about who are your instructors, who are the people in your world, how are you furthering your relationship with them? Every interaction, you are making an impression on them. So it's an opportunity, an opportunity to show yourself as someone who is amazing. You want to have multiple interactions with them. You want to have someone who is particularly knowledgeable about you. The key, especially right now in a pandemic world, but I'm gonna say it's still the key, even if there were no COVID at all, the key comes down to how well can you communicate with these instructors, starting from the point where you are just one face in a big class, to you being one face in some office hours, to having repeated interactions with them. So what do you do? Let me give you uh, some examples. So I, I said, after you've thought about who are the people that something about them you connect with, it's in a field that you like. How do you make that initial contact? What do you do? This is really hard. It's especially hard if you're someone like me, I am extremely shy. I, I'm awkward socially. I 
never went to a single office hours in all my years as an undergrad at UCLA because I get nervous, something like that. If I'm going somewhere and I don't know someone, it's very hard. So how do you make initial contact in a situation where if you don't, it might never happen? Let me show you a few examples that I've received from students. So here was one email that I got. An email is probably how this first interaction is going to be. So this student, Kim, writes to me, Dr. Phelan, I felt compelled to email you. Today was the best LS4, this is a class like LS7B. Today was the best LS4 lecture I have attended all quarter. The chicken co-dominance study, the evolution of antibiotic resistance, a young TH Morgan and the raccoon pick were just a few highlights. I was positively giddy during and after lecture. I eagerly await your next lecture on Friday. Sincerely, Kim. P.S. I really enjoyed the group lunch I had with you back in the day when I was enrolled in LS2, spring quarter of 2013. You gave me life advice that really came through for me. Thanks. This is a great email. This is someone who I'm going to follow up with. She has, has done a bunch of things here. She said nice things about class. She's given me context. She's talked about the fact that she has enthusiasm for this subject. She's talked about the fact that she remembers a bunch of different stuff, not just the content, like the, the hardcore content, but the whole environment of the class. She reminds me that we had some previous interaction. And what is she asking for here? Nothing. She doesn't ask for anything. On my list of, of things to read in an email, someone saying positive stuff and not asking for anything, I like that. So I, I of course, wrote back to her. I'm so glad that you're in this class and that you're having a good uh, situation, whatever, that you're, you're enjoying it. You'll have to stop by office hours one of these days. I'm kind of curious now to hear about you know, the life advice or whatever, something like that. But I'm going to write back to her. Or something like this, another student wrote, it's longer, but you know, it's still just two paragraphs. Hi, Professor, I'm a student from your LS1 class this quarter. I'm writing you this email because I regret not having said this in class directly to you. And it's probably easier for me to say this now than before since one, you don't know me, and two, I will no longer be seeing you and I won't have to worry if I said yes to kiss up, et cetera. This is at the end of the class. Thank you very much for your teaching. You made the course material much more interesting to me in addition to the course materials. The overall class atmosphere you created from your business attire to your careful overhead notes, problem sets on bright color papers, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know why it was so hard to say it in person, probably because I feared that you would interpret my intentions as trying to get on your good side, et cetera, which would be true of certain professors. I mean, with some of them, you just don't feel that connection, but yes, and I'll stop because it seems like I'm kissing up more. Thank you. I enjoyed your course very much, Ronald. That's a nice email. You know, he's self-effacing. He is reminding me what was our interaction? What was the class? Why did he like it? It has a lot of good features. Could he, you improve it? Yeah, you could improve any email that you ever send. If you view them as having a first draft and then you fix them, I might go in and I don't think he has to be quite so self-deprecating, but it's fine. I think that his personality comes through. Uh, and, you know, he might tell me even just more about him and what he's doing at UCLA or something like that, but thanking me. But that's it. All it is is laying the groundwork. So the f next take home message is that if you have something that's short and positive and memorable early in the term, early in the term is especially good because the instructor isn't getting bogged down with a bunch of people asking very specific questions about some content. They're just saying, hey, I'm loving this class for whatever reason, I'm excited about the content or I like what you did or, or something. Identify the people that you can do this with that you think potentially might be useful. This is part of the 10 to three to one. So this is gonna be fun. For the instructor, it's going to be low effort. It's not that you're manipulating them. It's that you are telling them something that's true that you might not have thought about doing otherwise. After that step, you have to think about, all right, how do I deepen the relationship here? If I'm going to have someone someday write a recommendation letter that is super effective at getting stuff, how do you do that? Probably the best way is after you've first written an email, as I said, something that conveys your personality, sets you apart, also shows that you can communicate clearly and concisely. It has to be well written. 
Those are all going to maximize the chances that it gets a response. But after you do that, now you need the next step. It might be that you're looking for a research job or something in office hours or something. Here was a student who was making a pitch for something more. And his email just goes, hey, professor, I'm looking for a research position and I want to know if you do research and need any students. Best, Nolan. Well, do you think Nolan's going to get a research job in my lab? I'm not really impressed by this email. He want, I want to know if you do research. So he hasn't even done a Google Scholar search. He hasn't listened to what I've talked about in class. Uh, hey, professor, he hasn't really conveyed anything about his personality. It's not that you think, all right, I'm just finding out some information. Later on, I'll do the good one. Every interaction, if it's not good, it's bad. So you have to use all of your chances to make a good impression. This email probably is, is going to end up not getting a, a response. And I feel bad. Maybe Nolan is a great guy. Maybe I could have helped him. Maybe it would have worked out. But in his, his chance, he didn't really convey much that was going to be useful. Here's a long one. You don't have to read uh, this, but as soon as I start doing it, I tend to read these in the same way. I skim them to Professor Phelan. On the first day of LS2, spring quarter, I walked into Lucrez with vivid interest and confidence. When I exited, I left with passion, motivation, humility, most importantly, the ability to methodically examine my surroundings. Blah, blah, blah. So then I skip down. I see some specifics about Xanax, Will Butrin. After receiving low score on the midterm, I wondered if I was even capable. So now I'm kind of intrigued. Well, yeah, this person telling me, hey, I didn't do so well. Although you probably don't know who I am, you impacted my fundamental perceptions of the world and of myself. I'm wondering if you had any available positions in your lab so we could work together. Blah, blah, blah. If you're interested, I have attached my, my CV for your perusal. Blah, blah, blah. That's a great email. It, it pulled me in. It said, here's, here's who I am. Here's my personality. Here's the context of how we know each other. Here's a challenge that I had, but I was able to bounce back from it. And all those things work together to make me think, I want to get to know this student. I want to, I want to know more about what their story is. So it has strengths in that it is articulate. It conveys a lot of useful information to me. And it's clear what the person's looking for, and it's likely to lead to a follow-up message. You have to remember when you're sending out something like this, the goal of this letter isn't for you to get a recommendation letter. Every interaction has a specific goal. And I asked my brother uh, a lot. My brother works for the FBI. He was a uh, UCLA student years ago. But in the FBI, a lot of what he does involves recruiting people who might have information that they want to share with with him in exchange for something else. But I ask him, I say, so when you go into a meeting, what's your goal? And he says, in most cases, my goal isn't to get them to give me something. My goal is to get the next meeting. And I like that because it can change how you act. If your email is written with the goal of having another interaction, then that helps you know what you should do when you're doing that. Or you might have, have this. Here's another email that I get. I get these all the time. Dear Dr. Phelan, I wish to apply for a research position in ecology, environmental, remote sensing, or hydrology in your group. Currently, I'm studying ecology at Yunnan University, a famous 211 university in China. This was odd for me to get because I don't do environmental remote sensing. I don't do hydrology feels like he hasn't done his homework on me. Then he says, I'm studying at a famous 211 university. Well, he puts 211 in quotes, maybe because he thinks I don't know what it is, which I didn't. So I was just a little bit off put. As I read down the letter, it feels like he just blasted this out to 100 people trying to find a job. That was the sense I got, that there was no connection to me or some intera interaction we had had. Therefore, I don't feel like he's legitimately, legitimately approaching me about maybe having some, some opportunity together. So in that case, that's a huge fail that I don't think that, that there's some reason why we would have further interactions. What about something like this? 
This guy says, hi, Professor Phelan. You probably don't remember me at all. My name is Tony. I was a student in your LS2 class. I had lunch with you a few times too. I'm contacting you because I'm wondering if you're doing any sort of research. And if you are, would you be willing to take me as an undergrad research assistant? Uh, blah, blah, blah. He says a few others, but he has some specific information in this, this email where he's telling me what our interactions were. He's saying that he tried to, uh, he contacted me before about it, but I had told him that nothing was going on. But then he says some nice things. This is specifically why I'm approaching you. So in contrast with the previous one, I at least am reading this knowing that this is not a batch letter that he has, has cranked out to a whole bunch of other people. One last version of someone then making a pitch, something like this. My name's Parveen, I was a student in your L7B. I wanna thank you for a great class. Your lectures were interesting, never missed a single one. That's an achievement for me. A little bit of humor is always fun. You know, I wanna see her regular person. To be honest with you, I wasn't really looking forward to taking the class. I heard from my roommates how tedious all the memorization would be, but I was really impressed with the way you taught the class, blah, 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 blah. So these are positive things and they're, stated in an interesting way. I love science, but I've been a little discouraged, blah, blah, blah. Also interesting. P.S. By the way, I finished Mean Gene. This is a book I wrote last week. I loved it. Raised a lot of questions that I'd really like to discuss with you if you have time. After reading it, I realized how great it was that you brought your experience and insight into a class like L7B. I don't think I would have appreciated the material nearly as much if it weren't for all your unique examples. Again, giving me a sense of her personality, but also giving me a lot of context and pointing out, hey, yo, I'd like to talk to you more. Where can you do the additional talk? Well, in most cases, something like office hours. There is this pervasive and I think untrue feeling that a lot of students have that office hours is about you going and asking the professor to explain some concept again from class. Certainly you can do that. However, you've got Bruincast. You can watch the video. You have a TA who can explain it. You have a textbook. You have online resources. You have Khan Academy. You have a hundred ways that you could get the content explained again. But in office hours, you control the agenda. It's the one place where you get to decide how things go. So as you see here, these are just a few professors talking about it. I see it as an important method to get my get to know my students. That helps me teach better. Uh, at the heart of the undergraduate experience are relationships with others. But this one, it makes the school less mysterious if you know both other students and professors. I explained to students, you don't need a question to come to office hours. You can just come by to say hello. People do that all the time. It's great. Then you can ask them questions. You don't have to ask them to deliver content. You could say, hey, I'm not having trouble with any specifics of the material right now, but I'm wondering if we could talk about some big picture issues. You know, if, if you were a student, how would you spend your study time for this class? How does this differ from how you actually spent your study time? Or, you know, what surprises you most about student behavior? What do you think is the biggest mistake students make in selecting a major? Whatever, these are questions that are not always what they expect, but it's going to help you get to know them a little bit better. Here's one, this math professor, students don't need to be struggling in class to come to office hours. They can be a space to learn how to think better. You don't need a plan or agenda. Uh, the opportunity to have a rich and intellectual relationship, and in some cases, friendships with professors that will last over time is super valuable. You might ask things like, what do you think are the elements of an ideal exam question? Professors have thought about this a lot. Or what's your process for creating the lecture? What's your process for writing the exam? As you do these things, you're gonna discover some things about them. Now you're talking about real stuff with them. That's the foundation of a relationship. It differs from you treating them like a, a resource, like a, a living Wikipedia. Tell me this again. Describe photosynthesis again. That doesn't deepen your relationship at all. And it kind of just, you know, doesn't use your time with them in the best possible ways. Uh, here's another one. Conversations often also go beyond the course material into how the ideas are connected to other fields and applicable to the student's long-term goals. That's critical because those are things that your professor is going to write in the recommendation letter about how they've seen your career goals change and mature and develop over time. Well, how do they know about that? Only if they've had those interactions about those sorts of things. You have to make that happen. 
Some professors might just naturally ask you those questions, but a lot of them might just sit there in a passive way until you turn it into something where you are engaging in substantive ways about big important issues. Remember that every one of your professors got a PhD. They had to figure out a route through school. They probably had some struggles you could ask about. The, the options for what you can talk about are huge. Key thing is when you are there, you have to get inside their head. You have to model their world, what's going on in their world. So you have to be polite, considerate. Even if it's office hours, say, hey, is this a good time to talk when you leave? Hey, thank you so much for uh, everything you shared or something. Be prepared in terms of have these things written down ahead of time if you can and give them context. This is my name. My name is Jay and I'm in your class and we talked about this last week. Even if you think that they're going to remember that from last week, this quarter, I have, I think, I don't know, 700 students. I had that many last quarter, the quarter before. It's hard to remember all of them all the time. As soon as you nudge me, then I remember it. If you say it immediately, hey, my name is Christina, blah, 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 blah. Then I get to say, yes, of course I know that. But now I'm like, thank God she told me your name again. I had forgotten. And you, you fill in the gaps. Uh, remember, we talked about this. You follow, follow up. So you want to be really strategic in what you're doing there. This was a, uh, an article. In, there's, there are people who actually study office hours, and they looked at the relationship between office hours visits and academic performance. Most people, literally the majority, never go to office hours. The people, not that many people go three to five times. You don't have to go every time. If you go every other week, that's one time. That's perfect. That's fine. But what they showed was a significant positive relationship with academic outcomes. People will tell you this. Everyone will say, oh, you got to go to office hours. What I'm telling you is that you have to go to office hours and use them wisely with the goal of nurturing these relationships, not with the goal of getting your professor to say the descriptions of contents again. Sometimes that's fine. But, but you, can, you can do more with that. So here's, a, here's another take home message. Remember, you set the agenda. So you wanna explore deeper less, lessons about motivation or passion or learning or career paths, intellectual exploration. All of those things can be accomplished in office hours. But it's up to you to make that happen. You make it happen by thinking about it. And I'll, I'll tell you right now that there are so many students at UCLA who they think they have it all figured out. They imagine, oh yeah, everyone told me, go to office hours. So I go to office hours and I have a list of 32 content questions that I'm going to ask. They think that they're developing a relationship. They're not. They're just trying to, to get them to be their own private uh, tutor for the class which is not that satisfying for them. But when you then ask this big picture question, they're gonna look at you if it's one of these group office hours and they're gonna give you the evil eye and do a heavy sigh like, ah, all right, now we have to wait for a few minutes for this so I can get back to explaining you know, photosynthesis again or something like that. Don't be bullied by them into imagining that that's what the agenda of office hours should be. You have every right to talk about these other questions, which are going to be more useful, not just for you, but for everyone. Also, you want to be careful. There are, you know, if you're a professor, you know immediately people come. Maybe it's about grade grubbing, or maybe they just want some quick answer. They maybe they haven't thought at all, and they're just wasting time. Uh, stuff like that. Don't be like that. Uh, that you're trying to convey to them that it's about your relationship with the course and the content and the instructor that's what you're interested in more than these other things obviously the other things matter they know that that they matter to you so you don't have to convey that after this you need to stay in contact in ways that don't create a burden every so often you can just stop by to to let them know, hey, I still think about your class. I still like it. Or, oh, hey, I'm doing this and it's been a lot of fun. Or, oh, hey, I read that thing you told me to read or you suggested. Something like that. All of those are important. You have to think about the, the long game. And that might be something like this. Here, here's a guy who wrote to me, Douglas. I took your class as a mere GE. Now I'm inspired to pursue graduate work in biology. 
Uh, you have an incredible gift for teaching, blah, blah, blah. I greatly appreciated the time you took after class to answer my odd questions about the mind, determinism, and biologists. I feel that knowing how the body works takes the magic out of life, and yet I feel compelled to know more. My sense of all once reserved for the mystical is now directed towards the intricate functions of the body and brilliance of evolution. Thank you for a truly life-changing quarter. Aside from forcing my family to read Mean Genes, I will definitely look to enroll in any Ellis classes you're teaching in the future. Again, he's not asking for anything, but he's telling me about the class, its impact on him. He's conveying his personality. He's showing a little bit of humor. He's showing me that he can write beautiful paragraphs, beautiful sentences, all the things that are going to play into my letter about him someday when he asks for it. This is gonna help him with a ton of different stuff throughout his academic career in all likelihood. Uh, here was another person, another long one, just after the fact. Also, I would like to you to know that you are the reason that I ended up applying to Harvard. Before we talked about it, I thought that it wasn't, I wasn't really Harvard material, and I was probably better off just being happy with my West Coast options. Your encouragement to apply and your enthusiasm for the opportunities that presented themselves during your education there made me want to apply. Here I am now with a chance to attend. Blah, blah, blah. I would seriously like to thank you for your help. He might have thought, wow, now I'm done. I got in where I want not true. You always need additional stuff. Don't view the rec letter as the end game. You're going to finish medical school and then you're going to want something else. You come back to those professors. Now they've known you even longer and they can talk about your maturation or other things. So don't neglect that. These people, they need other stuff and your professor will help them. This was someone who, who wrote to me, I, I know you won't remember me, uh, but I took your class eight years ago, uh, blah, 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 then something else. I'm writing because my students, I teach high school now, just took their AP bio exam yesterday and I was reflecting today on how I got here and who helped me along the way. Well, this turns out to be a great email that she wrote, and it was so good, I looked into, well, what's she doing te teaching this AP bio class? I invited her to bring her class to UCLA and her students. And then there's this big award for the National Association of Biology Teachers. So I helped with a nomination for her to get Biology Teacher of the Year in California, which she got because I thought she's an amazing person. So she didn't, wasn't even asking for anything, but she still got it because we had this relationship and I thought she should get something. She should get you know, recognition or something like this. And there are a million different ways to do that. You probably don't remember me. You know, I'm currently in Madagascar working as a Peace Corps volunteer. Not asking for anything, just telling me stuff, but you don't wanna neglect the long game. Little notes that just tell me what's going on. I get these all the time. I love getting them. Uh, they, they just keep you in the, in the forefront of, of my mind and they help me with subsequent letters. So the last thing, sorry, I'm uh, just gonna spend a minute here on this. When it comes time to asking for the recommendation letter, there are a lot of ways that you can do it, but I'm gonna tell you that if you always work with the assumption of you want to make it as even easier than, than it should be for your instructor, that's going to be better. I love when I'll get a packet from someone and it might be all electronic, but they might say, I've also given you a hard copy packet, which I've left in your mailbox or something, but it has a photo of the person with their name. It says, here's what class, here's what quarter, uh, here's what the letter is for. I like an sort of informal, but not really, I like it to be, articulate and good half page type note reminding me what are the interactions we've had saying some positive experience reminding me why here's why i'm interested in you some specific details it helps to have the transcript even if it's just the 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 unofficial one that's fine but it helps me remember and then if you have a personal statement for something you're applying for you can say hey this is just a first draft i'd love to hear comments even but just wanted to let you know what i'm thinking about and then you send the letter, you, you say, remind again, here's who I am, here's what I'm doing, I am, you know, I frequently attended your office hours, blah, 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 thank you so much, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm going to stop here. <laughs> I can take uh, any questions on anything. I should say, too, that, that every professor is different. The stuff that I'm saying, these are experiences of a lot of people that I talk to about this. 
It's certainly not universal, but I'm just giving you my, my experiences. I've written recommendation letters for more than 400 students at UCLA uh, and a couple other schools over the years. So I have done a lot. I try to find out which ones work, which ones don't to see how things go. Because if I spend time on the letter, I, I want to know that they get all the things that they want. I end up having a vested interest. And I, I almost feel like if they don't get what they want, that somehow I've let them down, the people that I have a good relationship with. All right, thank Christine, Thank you so I'll go. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the presentation. I learned a lot. Thankfully, I'm saying pretty much the same things when students ask me. So I'm happy that I uh, somehow uh, intuitively know what to say. So there are three questions in the Q&A. The first one, I am a transfer student that is graduating this June. I don't know who to choose to write a letter of rec for me, a professor who knows me better at community college or someone more prestigious at UCLA that probably doesn't remember me, but once said to all her students that she writes strong recommendation letters as long as we attend office hours. That's a really good question. And, and I think that almost everyone has some version of that dilemma. <laughs> because in the best of all worlds, you want the person writing your recommendation letter to be super famous and to know you really, really well in a bunch of different contexts that they can speak to that go beyond other things. But it never goes that way. It's almost always that the person you really know, but it's either a little bit older or they're not famous or whatever. In my experience, and I think Christina probably has, has a lot to say about this too. In my experience, the letter that can speak more specifically to you as a person, these are her strengths, these are her weaknesses, these are the specific aspects of her passion that come through. Those things that are not conveyed by your transcript, then it's going to have more value. So in this case, I would, I would say, all right, well, you've transferred from the community college, but you still have time at UCLA. So you should be developing these relationships too, so that you have options. But if you were at the point where, okay, now I'm applying and the people at UCLA don't have anyone who would have any recognition of me if they saw my, my face, I still might lean towards the, the person you know better because you want the letter to add value to your thing. That said, the person says, people come to my office hours, that person is great. You know that they are open to having conversations in office hour that are gonna be big picture if they think that's where we're gonna get to know each other in a way that I can write about you. I agree. I think you should ask the person who knows you best because that letter will be stronger and you spent equal time at your community college and UCLA. So I would go with the person who knows you better. Yeah, and also don't, don't imagine that, oh, it's a community college, so that's maybe not as prestigious as UCLA, therefore it holds less weight. Schools are going to view the fact that you were at a community college and then you're at UCLA and now you're applying for something else, that's awesome. That's the thing that says, hey, look at me. I'm not starting out in the best possible position. I am working my way through. I am you know, confronting these challenges and I'm succeeding. So the fact that a recommendation letter might be from this person from the community college, not only is it not necessarily a negative, it could be a big positive. I don't know, Jay, if you have used Interfolio, but if you have, can you walk us through how to use it? Well, yes, I, I have used it all the time. Walking you through how to use it, I have no idea. What happens is students sign up for an account, then they decide on where they're applying or what they're doing. Then what happens is when they say, here's the school, here's the school, here's the school, and the schools will tell you, okay, if you're applying, let's say it's medical school, they'll say, here's the information. And you enter it, I know, somehow in Interfolio. From my perspective as a letter writer, what happens is as soon as you say, here's the person's email address who's writing me the letter, I get an email, an auto-generated email from Interfolio that comes to me and says, you know, Christina has, has requested that you write a recommendation letter. Click on this link and it will take you to the form. So if it's a 
specific form for you know NYU. That's what shows up there, and I answer their questions, and then I click submit. Usually, it will it'll have their form, and then somewhere it will say, "Do you want to upload a letter?" Because what I like to do is I write a letter one letter, I put it on my UCLA letterhead, I have my signature on it, I save it as a PDF. Now, when they apply, I upload that. I haven't made it specifically for that school, but if I am asked by 10 students to write a rec letter, and all those 10 students are applying to 20 schools, I can't do it. But through Interfolio, I'll have a letter that will apply for all these. I might write two letters if they have uh, graduate school applications versus medical school applications, but I still can use that one letter for all of them. Also, it means that I don't have to send a hard copy in, which it requires me to, to get the address, to feed an envelope into my printer, to then feed another envelope into my printer when I've printed on the wrong side, to fold it up, to get to the post office, all that. You definitely want to use either Interfolio or there are a couple of recommendation letter services. They're all pretty much uh, equivalent in terms of being very, very good. So, but that, that's all I know about the specifics. Thank you. Next question. What should we do if we are in our third year and have been going about this the wrong way? Is there a way to expedite the process since this seems more suitable for a first year or second year? All right, don't, first off, don't feel bad, okay? I told you, I never went to a single office hour at UCLA. I struggled a lot. No teacher knew who I was at all, you know, as I, as I bounced down to, to academic probation or even subject to dismissal. But by the end, I was able to, I went to Yale for a master's degree. I then got into Harvard for a PhD and was able to come back here for a job. So even if you've started off slow or you've neglected this, you can recover. But there is no shortcut. So what you have to do is you have to very quickly start nurturing these relationships. They don't all have to be professors. Maybe you have a job. Maybe you have a job on campus, in which case you have a supervisor. Maybe you have a job. I had a job washing test tubes in the labs. Then I had to decide, do I want the famous guy who runs the lab or my supervisor to write a rec letter? And I thought, well, I'm going to get it from the supervisor, but I'm going to be the best test tube washer. And I had already been working for him. But when I realized that, I thought, OK, every time I go in, I'm going to make a point of being professional and competent and all that. So what I would say is, in the best of all worlds, yeah, you started when you were in your first year. But each successive year at college is more important than the previous one because you become more mature. You become more aware of what you like and what you don't like so that the relationships you develop at this later point, I think are better. If I have a student who's a first year student and I get to know him really well in the first two quarters at UCLA, there's a lot of chance that they're gonna be very different at the end. And then that maybe isn't going to be as useful later on. Maybe the relationship keeps going, but I wouldn't worry, but I would say that there is no shortcut. So if you're in a, your third year, you have to s develop relationships with at least a couple people this quarter, but it's perfect time to do it this quarter. And then you, you could even go back to someone that you had last quarter or the quarter before. Hey, I'm sorry, I never got in touch with you, but I keep reflecting on your class and how important it was. And it's really helping me in whatever current class. Uh, and then you might, if they write a nice email back, you might say, would you mind if I ever stop by your office hours? And if you know other students in your class don't have questions, I just have a few questions about as I'm you know trying to figure out my, my future plans that I would love to hear some insights from you. So you can sort of reach back a little bit to the people that you had the interaction with, but developed a relationship. So it's never too late, right? You, <laughs> you must be a mind reader because that was the next question. How do you ah. pick up a relationship? <laughs> so perfect. Thank you for answering that one too. Mm -hmm. So the next one, I am a senior that is also graduating. I'm getting ready to apply for medical school, but I realized too late about the importance of recommendation letters. In addition to a lot of classes being over Zoom, my professors do not know me. Is there any advice on what I should do? 
Yeah, that's a tough question. I think a lot of people are in this position, but the first step I would say, well, the first step would be don't neglect the fact that that you're not applying until June. So you are in a, a class this quarter where you can convey who you are. And there are a lot of topics that you can discuss with instructors this quarter that, wow, it's so weird for me that most of my college has been Zoom and you know I don't have these relationships. That's a good opening to talk about. How did you figure out what you wanted to study? How did you decide about applying? And then I would do the same thing. I would write back to the people that you previously had maybe on Zoom and say, hey, now that we're on campus, you know, I know that I'm not in your class and maybe I'm not allowed to come to your office hours, but if it's at all possible, I would love to be able to do that. I missed out on a lot of that as part of UCLA and I'm realizing that that is a, an experience that would have been useful for me. Is there any way that I might be able to stop by sometime? And you just go with that because they're going to say yes. They're going to understand that part of their job is mentoring people, helping people, writing rec letters. So always start, of course, and you've hopefully got this from the rec letters, remembering that all of your professors are humans and it doesn't matter how famous they are, how good they are. Everybody likes a little specific praise. My co-author on my book, The Secret Syllabus, Terry, he'll forward me emails from his students that are really nice. And he always asks me, he's like, uh, do you ever tire of praise? And that's our joke because of course we don't, no one does. It helps, just do that. It can't be fake, it has to be true, but you should be praising them. And that's part of the explanation probably for why you're trying to contact them. But you can reach back a little bit and you at least have, I think, I'm not going to say a good excuse, but you have a good explanation that this is Zoom, this is weird. So asking now if you could see someone in person makes a lot of sense. So we are at six o'clock. We have three more questions. So I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit because I don't want to take too much of your time. Do you know if we have free access to Interfolio through UCLA? I don't know. And but I, I am going to say so. I am going to say yeah again as as a as a professor and a person who writes a lot of recommendation letters just pay for it, whatever it is if you do have to pay because the few times where people are like oh do you mind if I just send you the list of addresses blah 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 it's brutal uh, because I do so many of these and I recently yeah one day it was only for like three or four people but I had to send out something like I don't know 24 letters it took me almost you know half of my Saturday just doing that whereas if it had been interfolio which they could have used it would have taken me you know you know 10 percent of that Next question, if I'm applying for a health related grad school, would it be weird to ask an English professor to write a, to write a letter of rec? Good question. Almost any graduate program is going to want to have something that's from a science professor. Usually they will even specifically say it. However, just like a lot of medical schools and graduate schools are really intrigued by people who have some experience in the humanities or social sciences. It might, it might be uh, when I was in graduate school, getting a PhD at Harvard, I shared my office with a woman. She was an American studies major. This is a biology PhD program, but they looked at her application. And they're like, wow, this is cool. We can teach you biology. We like your perspective. So asking this English professor if they have a good relationship with you, A, they're going to write a really nice and literary letter because they're, many of them are better writers. And B, it's going to be intriguing to the people reading it that they're speaking to some aspect of you that a lot of people don't have any commentary on. So I, you know, I'll, I would defer to Christina on this. My, from all the committees I've been on, my own recommendation would be a very strong, yes, get the English person. That is, that is a uh, very effective way to highlight some aspects of you that might not get as much play. As you mentioned, many schools have very specific requirements when it comes to letters of recommendation, and many health schools want to see one science and one non-science. So you will probably be well off with the English letter as well, in addition to potentially a science letter too. 
And the last question, do you recommend asking for letters of recommendation directly after the quarter ends when our interactions with the professor are fresh in their mind or when we want to apply to grad school? This is a hard question because you really don't want them to for, forget you. You want them to remember the context. However, remember, I am trying to convince you that you're not trying to find a recommendation letter writer. You're trying to develop professional relationships. Therefore, the end of the quarter, that's not the end of the relationship. That's the beginning. That said, if you're worried, oh, I might have a hard time keeping in touch with them, one of the things that a lot of students do for me is they'll say, I loved your class. I think probably in the future, I'm gonna be looking to a graduate program that no doubt will want recommendation letters. I hope it's not too presumptuous, but it would mean a lot to me if someday I might be able to ask you for a recommendation letter. I don't need it right now, and I don't think it would be as useful because hopefully uh, I'll get to know you better over the years, but do you think that might be something that's possible? I get these all the time and I say, yeah, absolutely. And I will even say, and you know, it's probably better that I hold off writing until the time comes that you're applying because now instead of getting writing in the first paragraph, I have known, you know, this student for, for half a year. I've known this student for three quarters. I get to say, I've known this student for three years and they had this class or you know and then i get to say in the in the many interactions we've had since the class i can also say that i've seen this development so you you put it out there that you might someday like to get one but that it doesn't have to be right now that then gives you your your foot in the door later when you want to say hey remember you know me you said you might be able to and then you refresh their memory that can that can be fine and people do that all the time I think it's good. I think that it's okay. It gets it out there because I know when I have these interactions with students that I'm they're going to want a recommendation letter later. So it's fine for them to like get the nervousness out of the way of, oh, someday might you be able to write one? And I get to say, yeah, hypothetically, someday I, I will write one for you. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much. This concludes our um event thank you very much for all the insights that you shared i was very um happy to hear some of the things that i've been telling students um and thank you for being here today thank you for the students for the great questions i'm gonna stop recording now